The idea of these protests that are becoming so regular now over the course of, uh, of Gaza and, uh, and Palestine more generally, uh, we're joined in the studio by the political commentator John Oxley. And, and John, this is sort of becoming a weekly event now. Yes, and I think what we've seen is this is really motivating a huge amount of people in this country who perhaps we don't always see out on protests. And I think it's really interesting to see how this has galvanised so many people and is becoming an established thing. There's obviously quite a network there. And, you know, I think it's something newly emerging in British politics and could really have electoral and political impacts as well. Mm. Yes, should we have a look at what um, the security minister, Tom Tugendhat, said about whether people have the right to protest in this way? I think the priority has to be to allow people to have that moment of grief, that moment of national mourning that we share together on the 11th of November at 11 o'clock and, of course, on Remembrance Sunday as well. And I think that's, that's absolutely where the focus should be. Of course, there are rights to protest at other times. Of course, it's right that people should express their views uh, freely. But what's also right is that others have the right to come together and to be quiet and to be still for those two minutes, which really unite us as a country and remind us of the huge sacrifices paid by so many. So this is all about competing rights for Tom, the security minister. Yes, and I think that's the best way of looking at it. <laughs> but also for you, I think. Because there are too many people are called Tom. So it's a deeply, that's what we should it's, ban. Do you know what? This is, this, 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 it's what, it, what, it's what, it must be very irritating in Islamic countries where you just say Mohammed and everyone turns their head. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's an appropriate joke to make or not. But, yeah, but going back to the overall point, you know, he's, he's right. You know, the people who died in the wars died for our freedom, and that is our freedom to do stuff and to protest. And I absolutely agree with, I think, both of you that this is quite a disrespectful thing to do, to go out on Armistice Day. It is probably counterproductive. It's not going to persuade people. It's going to alienate a lot of people. But freedom means allowing lots of things that we find distasteful and disagreeable. Mm. And we should be very, very careful. You know, it's one thing if they're going out openly supporting violence and terrorism. It's something slightly different if they're just making their view heard. Well, I think that's the issue, isn't it? Because unfortunately, we have seen with some of these pro-Palestine marches that they attract extremists among the throngs of people who rally in the pro-Palestine uh, protests. And that's the issue. I think a lot of people are concerned that the police aren't policing as, as, tough, as tough as they should be, essentially. They're being too soft touch, is what I'm trying to say. I, I think there's a definite argument there, and we've seen very shocking things said and done by some of these protesters. But I think we also have to think about how the police handle these mass incidents. You know, the police strategy generally is to record evidence and deal with them afterwards, because you know, you're talking about respecting Armistice Day, going in mob-handed to, to arrest 30 troublemakers in a crowd of you know, 10,000 people potentially you know, creates a spark and a riot point that makes the whole thing far more disrespectful of the peace of Armistice Day than sort of letting these people carry on and then going and seeing them. You record them, you have the evidence, and then you can act afterwards. Mm, no, I think interesting it, point. I think it's worth saying what the Met Police have said. So 17 hours they put out a statement um, saying that officers will be deployed across London on the 11th and the 12th of November. Significant policing and security operation. Absolutely committed to ensuring the safety and security of anyone attending commemorative events. We know that there are concerns about a demonstration by pro-Palestinian campaigners. They say this is a weekend with huge national significance. We will use all the powers available to us to ensure anyone intent on disrupting it will not succeed. So that's quite a strong tone from the police. Yes, and it sounds like you know, partly they've had a couple of weeks of dealing with these protests. They've mm. got used to it now. It's not taking them by surprise. And also to remember this is such an... You know, big weekend of national significance that this will not just be a public order thing, there will be counter-terror issues to take um, to bear in mind and so probably you've got a lot of the Met working together and taking this quite seriously to make sure there are no flashpoints, to make sure there's no major incidents to keep everyone safe but also to respect the boundaries of the law around protest and freedom to say what you want to say. Now, we just have a couple of minutes to dwell on another big political story this week, which, of course, has been the ongoing COVID inquiry. And perhaps one of the biggest flashpoints was when Dominic Cummings appeared before that inquiry. Um, but there's, there's someone a little bit interesting who's had some thoughts on Dominic Cummings and his appearance before the inquiry, and that's the supermodel Caprice. <laughs> she appears in the iNewspaper 
today saying the most remarkable quote. She says, I'm a huge fan of Dominic Cummings. Um, why is Caprice such a big fan of Dominic Cummings? Well, it, it seems like they're sort of backing each other. You know, people forget, but way back um, early in COVID, before we'd even entered lockdown, Caprice was sort of on one of these TV panel shows and she was calling for hard action, closing the borders, moving towards lockdown. And these health experts who were advising at the time, no, we didn't need to do anything, were, were quite mocking of her. And you know, it turned out really she was right. And you know, Dominic Cummins sort of highlighted this in his um, testimony, or certainly talking around it, mm. that she was right and they were wrong. And that sometimes you need to listen to people without the expertise or people who are prepared to challenge people. And mm. so I think she's probably got a bit of a soft spot for him. And, and this is a crucial point, isn't it? Because at the start of the pandemic, the narrative as things are set is that, oh, the politicians were saying, no, we don't need to lock down. And all the scientists were saying lockdown. But that's not what, what was the case at all. Right through early March, the scientists were saying, don't lock down. That's exactly true. And, but what we saw with people were taking it into their own hands. You know, I was working in the city at the time and it, each day it was getting emptier and emptier. Um, way ahead, you know, a couple of weeks ahead of actual lockdown. And then what happened was, I think it was Neil Ferguson came out with this new model. Mm. And it was that that suddenly chucked the government into becoming um, much more in favour of lockdown and moving to it. Mm. But yeah, the grassroots thing at the start, were people were way, way more cautious than the government. I mm. must represent the lockdown sceptics among us, though, and say that it seems as though there is an accepted storyline, a narrative now from this inquiry, that the issues with the government's response were that they were not tough enough with their lockdowns, were not quick enough in, um, in introducing them. Others might ask, was lockdown ever worth it? Are we going to have that discussion with this inquiry? I know you're, I know you're frowning well, there, it's Tom. Because I, cause I, cause I was, sat, I was sat through some of that testimony and I was like, they're not talking about lockdown at all. They're talking about politicians and their language. They're talking about swearing more than they're talking about the actual epidemiological discussions agree? that you think would be good. No, but we're talking when they were talking to Dominic Cummings, when you, Hugo Keith KC was talking to Dominic mm. Cummings, the assumption was, particularly from Dominic, of course, but also in the line of questioning, that the government had fallen short on its decisions in terms of the speed in which they were made. I don't, no? I don't necessarily think that that was the line of the questioning, because I, I sat through the entirety of coming. You don't think there's a narrative that, that's, that, that the government made mistakes in terms of when they implemented the lockdown rather than whether it should have been implemented at all? I think there are arguments in terms of who said what to when, whether Boris Johnson should have gone on holiday in that half term. That was a big point of discussion. But I think one of the big takeaways for me was the lack of discussion over the actual uh, epidemiological points. And, and perhaps that does feed into your argument. Perhaps there should be uh, listening what would have been the difference if there had been more voluntary measures as opposed to more mandatory measures. Um, as John Oxley, as you've been saying, people were starting to take things into their own hands anyway. That would have been a very interesting discussion. But I mean, discussion. on Tom, the way that but, they've highlighted that Boris Johnson was talking about trade-offs as if it was a negative thing, no? In terms of whether we should have been shielding the vulnerable as opposed to locking down all, all of the public? Yes, and I think there has been some sensationalist reporting mm. around that. Um, after all, it is a legitimate discussion to say um, uh, if, you've got, if you've got a dichotomy between the economy and a, a certain section of society, where do you draw the line? Mm. Um, final word to you, John Oxley. Do you have faith in this inquiry that we now learn is going to stretch on for many, many more years? Well, I think that's always the key question. We've seen time and time again, these inquiries go on forever. The Bloody Sunday inquiry went on for years, was hugely expensive. And often they fail to get into the real gritty questions. And they do get bogged down in supplementary things. And you know, the other problem is you're always chasing after the last crisis. You know, they will come out with all sorts of recommendations about how we deal with the potential for the next pandemic. But you know, then there will be you know, potentially a major terror attack and we'll find our response for that has been completely neglected in the same way that pre-pandemic planning had been. So I'm very sceptical that it will um, you know, really help governments in future function. Mm. Yes, I, don't, I, I imagine most people don't care so much about Dominic Cummings' use of foul language, more so than they care about how decisions were made and why mm. the restrictions were chopped and changed so much, yeah. why children perhaps were neglected when it came to the equation done 
to justify lockdown. All questions we want the answers to. Perhaps we will get those. It is going to be a very long many, and many expensive inquiry. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah, so John Oxley, thank you so much for talking us yeah. through those two enormous issues this week.